welcome to the Power is Now Media Affordable Housing Series. My name is Carolyn Sanseri, and with me today is Eric Lawrence Frazier, MBA, Vice President and Mortgage Advisor, NMLS 461-807, and President and CEO of the Power is Now Media. We have been talking about qualifying for the GSFA DPA programs and how to get a home mortgage. And we've been using scenarios to explain how the guidelines apply and to offer some solutions. So let's continue. We ended the last break with you saying, Eric, the most important takeaway is I want our listeners to understand co-signers, co-borrowers cannot help you with credit. You have to meet the minimum FICO score requirements to even get on the road to home ownership. So there's a lot of confusion around credit scores. How are credit scores calculated? What is a FICO score versus a score that you might get from say Credit Karma? And then how do I increase that credit score? And, and then finally, people are looking at whether or not you even need a FICO in the first place. So many questions around credit scores. We're gonna get onto all of them. It's gonna be a great discussion. Carolyn, you're absolutely right. I mean, why do we even need FICO in the first place? I mean, it is a it is a privately held company, yet it influences every aspect of our life. It is woven into the fabric of American life, from government to, to the consumer to business. We all need a FICO score just to operate. And then on top of the needing it, there's more confusion than ever about it, especially with all the different models from FICO score one to 10 to uh, all these uh, different companies getting into the FICO game. There's a lot of confusion and hopefully we can explain it today. I agree. So let's start with one of the things that comes a lot up a lot when I am talking to home buyers. They don't have credit or they have a really low FICO score. And in order to do that, we're going to get into another scenario to really bring this information home for those that are listening or watching this broadcast. So in this scenario, we're going to talk about a home buyer named Jack. Jack is 54 years old. He's never bought a home or financed anything in his life. He does have a really good job and he makes more than enough money to buy a home, but he is renting because he doesn't have any credit. Now for Jack, not having credit is actually because he doesn't want to owe anybody anything. He has a, a vehicle of his own, an old late model car that he bought with cash. He pays his rent with cash. He just has kind of a negative view of credit. And we see this a lot. He saw his parents struggle with money. He saw them get behind on payments on the car or the, the house. And he just steers away from having credit. But now here he is. He wants to buy a house. And in order to do that, he's being told he needs credit. What does he do? Carolyn, what a great scenario. Jack, I like Jack. Uh, I don't know about those who might be watching. They may be thinking there's nothing wrong with Jack. But I, I, first of all, I want to congratulate Jack for staying off the credit grid for so long. Uh, it's really important that people understand that credit, the industrial credit complex, makes everything cost more. I mean, from clothing and shoes and houses and cars, all of these things cost more because of the access to credit. Because when you have credit, right, when more people have access to credit, that increases demand. And when you increase demand, you do what? You increase price. And so the reality is, is that uh, credit has always been and always will be a convenience for cash. Because when you think about it, if you have the cash, why would you use credit? Why would you pay more, right? I mean, no one really wants to pay more for anything. If I'm going to buy a shirt for $100, I want to pay $100, not $110 or $120 because I put it on my credit card. So it doesn't make any economical sense to use credit unless you absolutely need to do so, like to buy a home. And so I recommend that more people be like Jack, uh, but Jack can also uh, you know, go a little too far. Uh, and uh, not uh, choosing to take on debt or credit to buy a house. That is a mistake. And, I, and we have some solutions for him with that. So with that, this FICO score, credit score starts to apply. 
take us into what exactly is a credit score. Carolyn, a credit score model is a tool basically used by lenders that determines a person's risk. How much of a risk do they represent? If uh, they were to extend credit to them, you know, what is the likelihood of them repaying that money? Now, uh, there are many credit scores and credit scoring models out there. Uh, and then there is the FICO score. And the FICO score is an actual trademark. FICO stands for the Fair Isaac Corporation. Uh, and FICO, actually F-I-C-O, is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And it, it is the, FICO is the leading analytic software company uh, that started in 1956 with a goal of helping businesses uh, determine risk to measure risk, uh, to either uh, to extend credit for the purposes of growing their company. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the more people who have access to credit, uh, then the more that people are willing to take on the risk themselves of buying things. And uh, so uh, credit leads to increase in demand, which in leads to increases in prices, which is always good for companies. And so Fair Isaac Corporation and credit scoring models across the board help companies to manage the risk so that they're taking on clients, extending credit to clients that represent a good risk. That makes sense to me and hopefully to our viewers as well. But there's a lot of different factors that are taken into consideration as part of this FICO score, this evaluation. What kinds of things are used to determine that credit worthiness? Well, there are a number of factors that uh, credit scoring models take into place. And this is why it is these factors is a reason why 100% of the top 100 financial institutions use FICO scoring models. 95% uh, of all institutions use FICO scoring models because it's a, a way to measure a, a number of factors that represent risk. And so the number one would be the payment history. If you've been extended credit in the past, are you making your payments on time? Number two, the current level of indebtedness. You know, perhaps you represent a, too much of a risk because you already owe a lot of money to a lot of people. Another is the types of credit being used. Do you have a lot of credit card revolving debt as opposed to very little revolving debt and say more installment type debts? And then the length of your credit history, are you just getting into the game and you, you, know, you have a credit file, a very thin credit file, maybe one or two creditors, or have you been in it for a while and you have 10, 20, 30 hundreds of credit lines that have been paid off or installment loans that have been paid off over the years. And then what about what's going on right now? Your new accounts that you're opening. Are you opening a lot in the last, say, year or six months or 90 days? How many and what types of new accounts are you opening? So those are some of the, say, factors that represent risk to creditors. So the lender is looking at these factors, but how does someone understand or know how much does your payment history make a difference versus the accounts you have open versus how much you have in credit out? So Carolyn, as we mentioned earlier, there are a number of factors that determines the score. And what FICO does is they weigh each of those factors uh, to determine the ultimate score which can be as low as 300 or as high as 850. And so uh, we're going to work from the top down. Uh, the factors uh, that uh, perhaps carry the greatest weight. And the first one would be, and it should probably be obvious to everyone, and that is your payment history. It's 35% of the weighting. And so if your credit score is low and you want to improve your credit, start making your payments on time. Uh, the sooner you do that, the better and the faster your score will rise. And so that's a huge part of it. And it's really good news because a person who has missed some payments, well, it's just a matter of time if you're making payments on time since you missed a payment, that the impact of that missed payment will go away and your scores will go up. Another factor is the amount that you owe on credit card. And we call this capacity. You, you don't want your, your balances of your credit cards to exceed any more than 30%. And 30% is max. 
The ideal scenario is to be like Jack, not carry any credit card debt at all. Use credit as a convenience for cash. But it's 30%. The amount of debt that you're carrying is 30% of the waiting. So imagine between making your payments on time and the amount of debt you're carrying, that's 65% of your score. That's, that's significant. And if you could pay attention to any areas those would be two really important areas to focus on. And then the next one is the length of your credit history. Now, you may not be able to do anything about that, especially if you're a young person just getting started. It is what it is, right? You're going to have to do the time. Uh, just make sure when you're, as you're doing the time that you pay on time and that you keep your account balances low, no greater than 30% on revolving debt. Now, another thing is the new credit. Uh, the new credit is really important because uh, if you're just getting started, you want to make sure you don't load up on a whole bunch of credit cards. You only really need one or two credit cards. And then, you know, you may be financing or may not be financing a car, and that's a whole other discussion. I don't recommend doing that. Uh, but your, your credit mix is important. And, and FICO is is looking at from a risk standpoint. Do you have a whole bunch of revolving debt and no installment debt? Uh, do you have a whole bunch of department store cards and no maybe traditional money cards? And then it goes back to how are you making those payments and how much do you owe and what percentage? And so uh, the credit, the new credit is 10% of the waiting and the credit mix, the type of cards you're having or debt that you're carrying is another 10%. So the good news is that if you're just getting started with building credit, your credit mix is 10%. That's, you know, installment versus department versus visa versus, uh, you know, mortgage or credit card debt, all the various, and also finance company versus bank. All those things have some, some part in the analysis uh, and that analysis results in a score that's weighted 10% of your overall score. So you want to really look carefully at the type of credit you're taking on. You want to uh, move slowly and, and, and adding new credit. Uh, so you're being careful with not only the type of credit, but adding new credit and not adding it so quickly because, again, the weighting is 10% there. So, Carol, just to sum this up, uh, for those who are who have been in the game for a while and uh, you you know you've had credit for years and your scores are not where they need to be, the good news is just start making your payments on time and pay off your debt. For those who are just getting into the game, be careful on the types of credit you're bringing in and always be certain to keep your credit card debt paid off or at a very, very low balance and also to make your payments on time because you can have a credit file just one or two years old and have a very high FICO score and be in a position to uh, take advantage of the finance opportunities and the down payment assistance opportunities to purchase a home. So these are great tips for somebody who's trying to improve their credit, really focus on that payment history, the amount of credit you owe, try to keep that lower. What about Jack? You've got Jack here who doesn't have any credit. And in order to apply for a mortgage loan, he's going to need it. How does he start establishing it? And what would you suggest he does specifically? If you're building credit, or you're trying to maintain credit, or you have, you know, because you've already established credit, then the first thing I need you to understand is that you and Jack only need a few credit cards. I mean, it, it, one or two at the max. And if you want a higher credit limit, contact the creditor. I'd rather you contact the creditors you have and ask for a higher limit than to go out and get additional credit cards. And it, it's just, uh, to me, it makes more sense to go deep and not wide and, and start using the ones that you had and build that track record. Go deep, not wide. Ask for an increased uh, limit if you need more credit. And in many cases, they'll even give it to you without you even asking based on how you're managing the account, making the payments on time or never exceeding no more than 30% of the limit. You'd be surprised. They want to actually entice you to take on more debt. And so they'll They'll lower your interest rate. They'll increase your credit line to try to get you to take on more debt because you've been such a great customer. So you, you don't want to uh, 
take on a lot of credit card debt. You just, you need, I think nobody, I don't care whether you're 18 or 118 years old. I don't think anybody needs more than one or two uh, money cards, credit cards. And I don't think you need the department score cards at all. Okay, so you want to build some credit and you get a couple of credit cards to use them. Now, you don't want to talk to me here about how to use them most efficiently. Are you encouraging us to max them out? Are you encouraging us to, you know, put a small amount of money on it just so that the, the credit agencies can see us paying that amount and then, you know, having another $50? Like, you know, I think sometimes people think that you've got to have a lot of money on these cards in order for it to get evaluated as developing credit. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. In fact, the biggest myth out there, and I've heard, um, I've heard many clients tell me this that their parents told them, "Well, let's go get, let's go finance a car. You know, they need a car to go to school or from college, what have you. Let's finance a car so you can start building your credit." The worst advice any parent could give a child, or let's get you some credit cards so you can start building your credit. Again, the worst advice any parent could give a child, or they could that, that or that any advice that they could receive from any adult is to just go get credit just to establish credit. So understand that you don't need to take on credit card debt to establish credit. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail in just a second. But for the credit cards that you have, uh, one, you should never put on the credit card what you cannot pay off immediately. That's the number one rule. See credit as a convenience for cash. And so absolutely, absolutely use it to buy gas and buy groceries and, you know, show the activity because you're trying to build your credit score, right? But you should go home, not wait for the statement. Every single credit, credit card on the face of the earth has an online platform where you can go in, look at your balance and actually make a payment in advance of receiving any kind of statement, whether it be paper or electronic. And so... You want to utilize your credit card debt. You never, ever want to go more than 30% of the limit. Never max out a credit card. Never go more than 30% of the limit. And I would say, if you're going to carry a balance for any more than 15 to 30 days, it should not probably be more than 20%. You don't want to, you don't want to get anywhere near that 30% limit so that it would have a negative impact on your scores. And then the other thing, too, is that you want to start exercising some self-control. Literally, we should only be living on the income we make uh, and we should be consuming that income. And so if you are living beyond your means, that means you're gonna start utilizing credit. Credit becomes a convenience for, not a convenience, it becomes a supplement to your income. And this is how people take on more and more debt. They use their credit cards to supplement their income. They max out that card. They go get another one and then another one and another one. And I, I tell you, Carolyn, I have seen people with hundreds of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. And honestly, I don't even know how the banks, when they look at your credit score and they decide to issue you a credit card, I don't know how they allow that to happen, uh, but uh, they do. And there are people I'm sure watching this right now sitting with 20, 30, 40, 50, $100,000 in credit card debt and uh, if they'll be honest with themselves, they'll you know that that credit card debt doesn't represent any asset that they can actually look around their house and see. It represents consumption and living beyond their means. So a way to maybe do this with credit cards and establishing some credit activity might be to use a secured card, right? Yes, what absolutely. Is it, what exactly is a secured credit card? Share that with our viewers. So I, I think the secure credit card is the, the next best thing to slice bread, as I say. I mean, because it is a way for a person to build credit and yet not take on debt. Because at the end of the day, you know, we measure our, our net worth. Uh, our, we, we measure our net worth by the amount of money we have in the bank and, and assets we have and the liability or the debts we have. And so if you have, you know, $500 in the bank and you have $500 in credit card debt, your net worth is zero. What you don't want to have is $500 in the bank and $5,000 in debt, your net worth is a negative $4,500. 
And so what I like about the credit card, secure credit card, is that they will issue credit to you based on how much money you put on account, and they will hold that money as collateral. And so if you ever get in trouble, if there's ever any disruption in your income and you can't make the payment, you can just call the bank up and say, hey, you know, I lost my job. I don't have any income or something's happened. I want to close the account. And they will then take those funds and pay off your balance, protecting your credit that you're trying to establish. Now, many people use secure credit cards to build credit. And I think it's a wonderful idea. First Bank offers a program where you can put as much as $5,000 uh, in a CD or a savings account, and we'll give you a $5,000 credit card line. In fact, it can even be higher than that. We even do the same for people in business. If you want to establish business credit, you can put the money in a savings account, and we'll extend business credit to you based on that secure data. Um, so we also do loans where First Bank will provide a loan uh, to you for $500, but they won't give you the money. They will take that loan and put it into a savings account, and you make payments of about $41 a month until it's paid. At the end of that term, it's about a 12-month term, they will release the hold they have on the money. And so you are building credit uh, with having the savings account, because that's also now part, how much money you have in savings account is also part of the credit profile now, and you're building credit with the established loan. And so I really recommend that as a way of uh, building credit without taking on the risk associated uh, when you are establishing credit and there may be a dis potential disruption in your income. And this, is, this, this can happen, especially for people just getting started in life, you know, go through some job changes and things of that nature. Anything can happen that could impact your ability to make the payment. That's why I love secure credit cards. Now, uh, they're available, again, just about with every financial institution and um, all of them report to all three credit bureaus that's TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And so it's a fantastic way, Carolyn, to build credit. That was great information about credit and getting credit cards and secure cards. But you mentioned earlier that there's a way for us to build our credit score, our FICO score, without getting credit. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And again, for those of you out there who think that to you know, build credit, you need to go to debt. Uh, you need to go finance a car that you know you really can't afford. You know, find something inexpensive that you can pay cash or take on some subprime or uh, credit card or, or loan. Don't do it. You don't need to do it. So let me tell you why. Uh, you have credit already. It's all around you, especially if you're out living on your own, right? So for example, your rent is credit. Uh, and there have been some changes now. I mean, every year, the credit agencies are all trying to um, uh, be more sensitive to those who uh, are not, you know, willing, if you will, to uh, take on the debt. And so uh, FICO scoring model nine uh, does, a, does give credit for people who are paying rent. And a lot of uh, property management companies are reporting the rent you pay uh, to the credit bureaus. And if they're not, then you can uh, have that information reported to the credit bureaus. And so uh, Experian and TransUnion uh, and uh, uh, Equifax all have programs now where uh, you can provide the information and there's a fee of course involved and then reporting your rent. And imagine this, you're paying a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month in rent and you get no credit. I mean, you get no credit for that. I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? And so to be able to have that put on your credit report, uh, it looks fantastic. It will have a, a definite impact on your FICO scoring model. And you've done that, or any credit scoring model, by the way, and you've been able to do that, build a credit score without taking on debt. You know, Eric, this is true because just last week, I went into my uh, Experian account looking at my credit and they gave me an option right there on the home screen. Did I want to boost my credit score by adding in some of the other bills I have? And right there, they asked me to add in my mobile phone. 
I put in my uh, cellular service provider and they, they were able to keep track of those payments. And I was able to add my utilities to my credit report. Um, and all of a sudden, it probably took about an hour, it actually boosted my score by about three or four points. And that was just two bills that I was able to add into my credit, credit uh, profile. So I've seen this in real life because I just did it last week. You see, folks, it's real. Carolyn's just did it. It's real. You do not have to go into debt in order to build credit. And the technology that is advancing in credit reporting is enabling utility companies and cell phone companies and landlords and property management companies. And, and these are things that we absolutely need, right? I, I need gas, electric, and water. I need to pay rent, you know, at least before I buy. I need these things. I don't need a car payment. I don't need a Visa card payment on, uh, you know, a $1,000 vacation that I took. I, I don't need, uh, you know, the personal loans that I took to finance things that I can't even see today. And so, but I do need utilities. I do need rent and the fact that it's available uh, for you to add that information to your credit card or to your credit uh, profile, it's a game changer for a lot of people. And especially those of you who are looking to buy a home now, because let me tell you, property values are going up, interest rates are going up. I mean, really, can you afford, really, can you afford any more debt other than your mortgage? I see applications every single day, Carolyn. And let me tell you, people are barely getting qualified because of all the other debt they have. And if a person can just get rid of that stuff, they would be far better off in the present and buying and in the future. Eric, this has been a great discussion around credit. I really hope this helps our viewers as they are looking at their own credit profile, determining how to establish credit or improve their credit score. For those of you just joining us, this is part five of the Power Is Now Media Affordable Housing Series with the Golden State Finance Authority. We are having a great conversation about credit, and we just finished talking about ways to establish credit or to increase your credit score. We have lots of more valuable information about credit to come, and specifically the FICO score requirement to qualify for the down payment assistance programs from Golden State Finance Authority. You are watching The Power Is Now TV. We will be right back. It's the American dream to buy your own home to build your own financial security, to call a place your own. Discover how easy it is to qualify for down payment assistance with Golden State Finance Authority. You don't have to have perfect credit or be a first time home buyer. Find out if down payment assistance will help you purchase a home in California. Call 855-740-8422 or visit gsfahome.org. Make your dream a reality. So Eric, let's talk about the actual guidelines for the GSFA down payment assistance programs. These programs are a great tool to help people who don't have a lot of cash in the bank, a lot of savings. It's there to help them purchase a home without having to wait years or um, a decade down the road in order to come up with that money for a down payment. But in order to qualify for down payment and closing cost assistance through Golden State Finance Authority, Home buyers do have to meet our minimum requirement in terms of their FICO. And it's actually very flexible. So can you go into the details about what FICO is required to qualify for the GSFA programs? Absolutely, Carolyn. And what's so great about the Golden State Finance Authority uh, and all of their programs is that you really don't have to have perfect credit. I mean, the minimum FICO score requirements are not really good credit, but it's good enough. It's good enough for you to buy a home now. Now, Carolyn and I have done, you know, this is part five of a four part series. And so uh, you can, I recommend going back to part two and three to uh, understand all the guidelines around qualifying for either the platinum program or the open door program. But for the purposes of this uh, segment, uh, we're just, we're looking at credit score. And here's the good news. For the Platinum program, the FICO score requirement is 640. And that's across the board, 640 for FHA, VA, 
USDA 644 conventional program. And if you can qualify for conventional, you save yourself a lot of money and not having to pay the 1.75% upfront mortgage insurance that FHA requires. And so the platinum program is 640. Now, if your score is not a 640, if it's lower than 640, well, I have good news for you as well. The open door program, the minimum score, and Carolyn, I really can't believe this. I mean, you're, Golden State is providing down payment assistance up to 6.5% for FHA VA USDA with a FICO score, actually 6.5% for FHA and VA with a FICO score of 620. FHA VA 620. USDA 640. USDA is a rural program, 100% financing. VA is 100% financing. FHA, 3.5% down. And again, on the open door, you can get in with a FICO score 620 FHA and VA, 640 USDA. And the primary difference in terms of down payment assistance between the open door uh, and the platinum program on the government loans, with platinum is 5%. With the open door and open on government loans is six and a half percent in down payment assistance. Now on the conventional product, the down payment assistance can be as high as seven percent, and the FICO score on conventional loans is also six twenty, which is much lower again than the platinum program. It's six twenty. Now there is a condition. It's six twenty if your income is not greater than eighty percent of the area medium income for your, uh, for your county. And you can go to the Golden State website and look under income limits, click on the box, find your county, and you can actually see what the income limit is for your county. So if the income limit for your county is, and your, your income is 80% or less in the area medium income, then the FICO score requirement is only 620. But if it's not, if it's greater, then your FICO score requirement is 620. Aiding. In either case, Carolyn, uh, the Golden State uh, Finance Authority has two incredible program, programs that are really designed for people who are kind of building their credit or on their way up from improving their credit to have, as you say, fair credit doesn't stop you from buying a home today. Yes. And I just want to reiterate to everyone, you don't have to have a low credit score to get down payment assistance. You can have a one that's in the 700s and the 800s as well, but the flexibility is here for those that do have a lower credit score, a fair credit score, going all the way down to 620 and providing you assistance to purchase a home. And purchasing a home, if you can, if you've got the income, if you've got a, uh, a DTI that, that fits the guidelines, if you have a credit score that fits the guidelines, it's an opportunity to get into home ownership instead of renting. It's an opportunity to start building some financial security by owning a home, by being a part of the real estate market. Carolyn, you're absolutely right. Now is the time to buy. Whether you have a great FICO score or a fair FICO score, you need to get in. I, I have watched the rates for these programs go up a full 1% just in the last 60 days. So time is of the essence. You don't need to wait until you have perfect credit. Just get in now if you can. And let's go back to Jack and many of our viewers who are looking to build credit or maybe improve their credit score. We had a lot of information in this part on credit. Can you give us a cheat sheet or just a top 10 list that's just real brief and easy to use we can take home from today's discussion. Carolyn, I have great resources for those who are watching us live on video. Please go to thepowersnow.com. If you go to thepowersnow.com, you'll find that we are leading the conversation in real estate for homeowners, for investors, for move up buyers. We have so many videos and blogs and articles and magazines. Uh, that really speak to credit and financing real estate. And in the search bar, if you type in Eric's top 13 credit strategies, or just type in top 13, it'll take you to a blog that I wrote about my recommended 13 strategies 
to build your credit. And let me tell you folks, if you follow those 13 strategies, you won't have to hire a credit repair company or do anything. I mean, you can do it yourself. You can improve your credit yourself. You can also go to qualify to buy now, qualify to buy now.com. Download my mobile app and there you'll find the 13 strategies as well as other resources available to you and even a calendar to schedule time to meet with me if you would like some advice as to what to do to improve your credit. And I don't do credit scoring. I mean, I'm not a credit repair person. I don't do that kind of work. But as a mortgage advisor, I do help people with direction and advice on improving their own credit. And if you like to hire a credit restoration professional, I can make recommendations if you need that assistance. So in addition to the 13 uh, credit strategies, Carolyn, uh, I also recommend following those, those strategies, I also recommend that everyone set up a budget. Go to Mint.com. I love Mint.com. It is a great program for anyone who doesn't have a written budget. Because let me tell you something, whether it's written or not, you have a budget, right? And so you just don't know what's going on. And so credit uh, Mint.com provides a way where you can have your budget at your fingertips on your phone at all times and know exactly what's going on and where your money, how your money is being spent. And then finally, sign up for a credit monitoring services. Now, Carolyn mentioned that she went on her experience. Uh, Experian has a program where they will help you monitor your credit. They'll notify you when there's inquiries on your credit or activities. And not just Experian, but TransUnion has a program, Equifax has a program, MyFICO has a program, Credit Karma has a program. There's a host of various programs. The Nerd Wallet has a program. There are so many programs out there. Just pick anyone, they're all fine to monitor your credit. And if you start monitoring your credit, set up a budget and follow my 13 strategies, I think you're gonna be okay. And you're certainly going to be in a, in a better position to buy a home today. Eric, it appears to me that these suggestions and doing the work to establish a good credit score really comes down to someone's commitment to actually becoming a homeowner. You're absolutely right, Carolyn. If you're not committed to improving your credit uh, to buy a home, or if you're not even committed to buying a home and, and making homeownership a reality for you and your family, then it's just simply never going to happen. It will take commitment. Uh, it will take uh, sacrifice. It will take discipline. It will take uh, perhaps a coach or a mentor, someone to hold you accountable to do the things you know you need to do in terms of paying off debt and reestablishing credit and, and saving money and living on a budget. I mean, these things are not easy. Uh, if it were that everyone would own a home, if it were everyone would, you know, be able to achieve all their goals. And the difference between homeownership and achieving goals is discipline. It really is. A discipline and a willingness uh, to be disciplined uh, mentorship and a willingness to be mentored and coach, uh, and also a plan and the willingness to execute on that plan with uh, integrity uh, and with a, a, a commitment uh, that perhaps you have yet, yet to ever, you know, a practice or put into place, a level of commitment that you have not seen perhaps in your own life or in the lives of others. That's what it may take. And that's life-changing stuff, Carolyn. It really is. And I know it can be done. And I'm seeing people do it every single day. I agree, Eric. People can do this. It is within your reach to become a homeowner. Get a mentor, get a coach, work with someone, work with a HUD counselor. And we are here to help you. This segment and the other parts of this home ownership series are here to give you information and tools. The power is now to become a homeowner. For those of you just joining us, this is part five of the Power Is Now Media affordable housing series with the Golden State Finance Authority. We are wrapping up a great discussion about credit. Next up, we're gonna talk about financial hardships or special circumstances that may have occurred. Things like divorce and separation, a foreclosure, or a short sale, maybe a bankruptcy or tax liens. 
we are going to get into these special circumstances and show you that they may not prevent you from purchasing a home. You are watching the Powers Now TV affordable housing series with Golden State Finance Authority. We will be right back. Everyone knows the power of social media and the impact a strong online presence has in this day and age. But most real estate agents simply do not have the time to manage all the advertising and marketing details. And that's where the Power Is Now Media steps in. We are the answer you have been looking for. Let us help put your brand on the map. We will create customized graphics for weekly full-page ads, social media content, video, and podcast content for you. Sound complicated and expensive? It is affordable and easy. We have the best experts on the job. Go to thepowersnow.com and find us under the VIP Agent tab to learn more. This is the future of real estate. Join today, thepowersnow.com.